So I want to welcome all of you to BC001, Understanding the Old Testament, its content, history, and a critical study. Uh, this is the BCS course through, uh, through Faith Theological Seminary, and uh, it is a Sarampur uh, course, the BCS course. So we're going through the various aspects of the Old Testament, and I will read through three objectives that we have. We have three objectives for this course, and let me read those objectives for you. Number one, to equip students to survey the significant historical development of various periods in the Old Testament. That's the first one. So what that means is the Old Testament can be divided into various periods of time. Okay, to give you a short example, and we will go through and explain further various periods of time. For example, you have the, uh, the time of the patriarchs, okay, and uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and that becomes one of the uh, major period of time for the Old Testament. Actually, even before that, we have something that is um, even more ancient history in the, uh, in, in the book of Genesis. Ancient history is often called prehistory, okay? The earliest times from Genesis chapter 1 to Genesis chapter 11 is called prehistory. Then you have the time of the patriarchs, and then you have the time of the Egyptian slavery, and, uh, and then the release from bondage to Pharaoh. And then after that, you have the wilderness period. Then you have the time of the judges. Okay, that is when the Israelites are in their own land, but they are learning how to live as neighbors. They're learning, they're becoming a nation. Then you have the time where they are entering into the new land, entering into the heritage that God has given them. Okay, and then you have a period of time where there is a monarchy, where the king begins to rule there. Okay, you have a monarchy time there. And then after the monarchy, you have what is called the divided kingdom. Okay, first you have the united kingdom and the divided kingdom. Then you have the exile. And then, of course, the return from exile. These are all various stages, one by one, that we find throughout the history and throughout the Old Testament. Okay, so first objective is to equip the students to survey the significant historical development of various periods of the Old Testament. Number two, to help students to get a general understanding of the content and message of the Old Testament. Okay, so basically, what is the Old Testament teaching? What are some of the main themes, theological points, and uh, what are some of the main teachings of the Old Testament. That's number two. Number three, to enable the students to be acquainted with scholarly debates on specific issues of various periods. You see, there are scholars who have different ideas about what the Bible has to say. Not all of these scholars may agree with exactly what the Bible says about different things. They may have different ideas, okay? Although they have different ideas, the Bible has a certain storyline. And some people have disagreement with that storyline. And they have some reasons for that. And we will look at some of those as well, okay? So these are the three objectives that we have. So first, we get into our outline of our syllabus, okay? We're getting into the outline of our syllabus. Number one, it's the general introduction to the Hebrew Bible. It's a general introduction to the Hebrew Bible. So we are talking about how we are talking about the main factors in the Hebrew Bible that are important to us. What are these? Okay, the general introduction. Number one, let me just um, open my notes here. Yeah, here it is. Okay, so the 
first part we talk about is the nature, authority, and inspiration of the Bible. The nature, authority, and the inspiration of the Bible. Okay? All right, what does this mean? We know, we understand the Bible as the Word of God. Okay? You have always heard of the Bible as the Word of God as scripture. These are all terminologies that we use regarding the Bible. But you also have to understand the Bible is literature. The Bible is literature. It is a book. It is a literature. So as a literature, okay, you will have certain features of literary features are there in the Bible. For example, the Bible has poetry. The Bible has songs. The Bible has uh, narratives, the Bible has history, the Bible has wisdom literature. All of these things are different parts of the Bible. And so the Bible is the word of God, but at the same time, it is also literature. See, the Bible is very unique because it is a collection of books. So the canon that we have in our hands, 66 books are there in the entire Bible, right? And 39 for the Old Testament. So the Bible is actually a collection. Some people might call it an anthology. That means a collection. That's all it means. Okay. So that's the nature and the authority and inspiration of the Bible. Now, what about the authority and inspiration? Is the Bible authoritative? Does the Bible have authority? Now, when you understand the Bible as the word of God, then definitely it has authority. If you see the Bible only as literature and not as the word of God, then it won't have authority. I hope you understand the difference. What I said at first is the Bible is the word of God. At the same time, it is literature. Okay, we know that the Bible is word of God. And at the same time, we know that the Bible is literature. So in that sense, I can see the Bible or I can understand the Bible as authoritative. Okay, but if there are some people who see the Bible as only literature, if you see it only as literature, then it has no authority on your life. Okay, then it is only like reading Shakespeare or some other book. It is just like literature. Okay, so authority and inspiration. What is inspiration? Inspiration is the idea that God has spoken to us through the scriptures. That is inspiration. Okay, there is evidence in the Bible that shows, the Bible mentions that God has inspired individuals to write the word of God. God has inspired the individuals to speak his word. And then those who spoke the word, they wrote it down or others wrote it down. So we understand the nature of the Bible is that it is the word of God as the same time it is literature. But it is also has a book of authority, but it has authority only if you view that as the word of God or as scripture. Some people, they don't view it as scripture. They only see it as literature. So then it may not be authoritative for them. Okay. Inspiration is the idea that God has spoken to us through the Bible. God has spoken to, to us through the scriptures. Okay. Also, we can say the aspect of inspiration is that God spoke and dealt with the people of all the old times, meaning like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or the prophets. God spoke to the people, and what they spoke has been recorded for us. People have written it down for us to read, and so therefore, we say this is inspired by God. Okay? Now, We'll go to the next aspect of the introduction, and that is the formation of the Bible. How was the Bible put together? 
I, in other words, how do we get this book? And uh, so what, you know, what, what is the process that we went through to get the Bible in our hands? And many people might say, I don't know. I just went to the store and I purchased the Bible and I got it. Or when I grew up, you know, my parents had this book at home and they, you know, they valued it and it was the Bible. That's all. Okay. But no, there is much more than that. We want to know what is the history. Okay. How was the Bible formed? What is the process of the formation of the Bible? All right. So if you look in your outline, you will see that first it says oral and written traditions. See, the Bible is a unique book in that it was written and compiled over many centuries. Okay, it wasn't somebody that sat down and started writing something. No, it was actually gathered and compiled and written over many centuries. So the events that took place, they became stories that passed on through the generations. So for example, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they lived their lives. They had families. They, they connected with the people of that time. And they also worshiped God. They prayed to God. They built altars and made sacrifices and they worshiped God. Okay. Now, who wrote that down for us? You know, what is there in Genesis? Who wrote it down for us? Did Abraham himself write down everything? Well, obviously not, because he doesn't write it in the first person. He doesn't say, oh, I. God called me in Ur of the Chaldees, and then I went to Canaan. No, he doesn't say that. It is that, rather, it is written in the third person. So someone else wrote it. So Abraham did not write it. Isaac did not write. Jacob did not. Someone else wrote it. It is written in the third person. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, so if it is written by the third person, that means the events that happened it was passed down from one generation to the next, okay? It was their heritage that was passed down through the generations. Now, how was their history, the traditions, the heritage, how was it passed down? Well, it was passed down in various forms, such as through songs, poetry, wisdom sayings, narratives, and all the different ways it was passed down. Okay, and so generation after generation, they would hear this poetry and they would repeat it and they would teach the, teach the next generation or songs of praise, <clears throat> songs of praise to God. They would teach that to their generations and then that generation also teaches it to the next generation. The stories of their ancestors, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and how God called them and, and how God spoke to them, all of those things were passed down, and from generation to generation, they received it, okay? And then we know that somewhere it was put into writing. When? We don't know for sure when it was put into writing. Now, it is possible that some form may have been written during the wilderness journey, okay? We know that Moses was the person leading the people through the wilderness. And during that time, it is possible that there could have been uh, writing of their traditions. Now, how do we know that? Numerous times, okay, in the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch is the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Numerous times, it says that God spoke to Moses, and Moses wrote down all the words in a book, right? It specifically says that Moses wrote it down. Now, I want you to understand, there are some scholars who believe that Moses wrote nothing, okay? That all of this was written very late. And then if you ask the question, then why does it say that Moses wrote it down? They would say that when they wrote it down very late, meaning many hundreds of years later, when they wrote it down, they would say they wrote down this so that it would look like it is very authentic. It would look like Moses wrote it down, okay? Because the people respected Moses very much. The people valued Moses as a leader. So they will say it like that, okay? So uh, 
but I would say that it is possible that Moses could have written during that time. But then later on, that writing, whatever Moses wrote, how much ever he put together, that could have been later supplemented and edited, possibly during the monarchy and even during the exile. It is possible that it, there a lot of editing could have taken place. Okay, now we go back to our, our syllabus and the next item we see is the writing materials. How was this originally written? Okay, in the early days, what kind of writing material did they have? And you have it there, parchments, scrolls, and papyrus. See, papyrus is a plant native to the Nile River in Egypt. Papyrus is a plant that is native to the Nile River in Egypt, okay? Uh, the Nile River Valley. And that papyrus actually is, that plant is taken and using that plant, they used to form some type of writing material like paper. Even today, our paper is made from some type of wood, right? We know that some uh, trees are used in this process. Second, parchment. Parchment is made from polished skin. Parchment is made from polished skin of calves, sheep, goats, and other animals. And it was used for writing materials. So obviously, the parchment was more durable for as a writing material, okay? Um, the parchment was much more durable because uh, the other, being more like paper, could get destroyed easily. But parchment could last longer. Now, what about scrolls? What is a scroll? Of course, scroll, in those days, they did not use, they did not uh, bind, have uh, books bound like this. They didn't do that. But instead, they had long sheets of this papyrus or long sheets of this parchment. And then they would fold it like this, okay? And so they would, basically, it will be folded together. And by doing this, they could open different sections and they could read sections at a time. So how long was it? It could be many feet long, many, many uh, meters long. And then it will be folded together as scrolls. So they would just open one side and close the other side or roll and unroll the sides and they could read it page by page, okay? Today, in modern day, we have made it differently where we can actually flip the pages, makes it easier for us to use, makes it easier for us to carry, okay? So these are the writing materials, okay? And uh, let me stop here and ask if anyone has any questions to ask, and then uh, I want to make sure that all of you are grasping what I'm talking about, and I hope you have the the outline of the syllabus in your hand so you can follow along with me. So does anyone have any doubts, any questions, anything you would like me to clarify or repeat? That also gives me a chance to drink some water. Okay. If no questions, I will continue. All right, we'll continue then. Okay, the next item is the meaning of Tanak, the Torah, Nabim, and the Ketubim. You see, the Hebrew Bible consisted of three parts. The Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, consisted of three parts, the Jewish people. It was the Torah, Nabim, and the Ketubim. Okay, taking the first letter of these three words, an acronym was created, T, N, and K, Tanakh. Thus, the Hebrew Bible became to be referred as the Tanakh. Okay, so what is Torah? Torah is the law. Torah is the Hebrew word for law. Okay, the, the books of law, what were the books in the Torah? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Now, in our modern Bibles, we might use the term Pentateuch. Jewish people use the term Torah. Okay, next one is Navim. Navim is the Hebrew word for prophets. 
Okay, so the books of the prophets are also listed. Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Okay, then we have, so we have Torah, Navim, and Ketuvim. What is Ketuvim? These are called the writings. These were uh, these are more uh, another part, the third part of their of their scriptures of the Hebrew Bible. Okay, what did the writings have? Psalms, Proverbs, Job, Song of Songs, Ruth, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, Esther, Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah. Um, Chronicles, first and second chronicles, all of these were there. Now, please remember that the books like Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles, originally they were one book. Okay. Originally they were one book. It was divided because it was easier to have it in two different scrolls. One scroll would be too large. So they divided that up and made it into two because it was too big to carry. And also, you need to note that in those days, okay, in those days, they could not carry the whole Bible with them together. Like we have the entire Bible in our hands, they could not do that because it was too large. Okay, so one book, like, uh, you know, when Jesus was uh, reading from the scroll of Isaiah, it says, okay, then he, after reading, he closed the scroll and he handed it to the attendant. So one scroll was just the book of Isaiah. One scroll would just be the book of First Samuel. One scroll would be Second Samuel, like that, because otherwise it would be too big to have all of it together. So having the entire Tanakh would mean an entire bookshelf, okay? It would be one entire bookshelf, but we have the privilege of having it to be able to hold in our hand all together, okay? All right, so that is the idea behind Tanakh, Torah, Navim, and Ketuvim. All right, next is the various manuscripts and translations. See, up to the time of the Dead Sea Scrolls in the 1940s and 50s, okay, that's when a lot of very ancient uh, copies of the Bible and other literature was found, 1940s and 50s, okay? But up to that time, or I should say before that time, Aramaic, Greek, and Latin translations of the Old Testament were used as primary material for the Hebrew scriptures. Since these are all translations, they would have a, a kind of a, a limitations and biases and sectarian uh, and contextual limitations would be there. And so... It was good, but there was always a doubt, you know, was this really exactly like the original? That's always a doubt, okay? Now, the Dead Sea Scrolls, when it was discovered in the 1940s and 1950s, they found in some caves hundreds of um, literature or ancient documents they found, which also included copies of the Hebrew Bible which is very important because scholars are still working on studying that. But it's very important because the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls has confirmed the accuracy of the text of the Hebrew Bible that we have today, what is called the Masoretic text, okay? That has, this, that has uh, uh, solidified the accuracy of the Masoretic text. So therefore, we are very certain now we are very certain now that the Old Testament that we have in our hands, we are very certain now that it is very much like the original that was written, okay? We can be sure of that now. Only slight changes that might have been more like spelling and usage and things like that, okay? So these are the various manuscripts and trans translations that were used. The next item is uh, the letter E, the formation of the Old Testament canon. Now, what is the meaning of canon? 
Okay, what is canon? Well, canon, uh, the word canon means uh, like a rule or ruler. Okay, canon is like a rule or ruler or measurement. That would be the canon. So we would say like, you know, okay, this person is uh, five feet, uh, nine inches tall or six feet tall like that. That is a rule that we have a measurement. In the same way, canon is rule or a measurement. That was the measurement that decided, these were the things that decided which books of the Old Testament would be included in the Hebrew Bible. We know that the Hebrew Bible includes 24 books from the Masoretic text, okay? 24 books from the Masoretic text that the rabbinic Judaism accepted. Scholars have not come to an agreement regarding when the canon of the Hebrew Bible was confirmed, okay? There's not sure when was it all confirmed. Some people claim that it was fixed by the Hasmonean dynasty, which lasted from 140 BC, okay? All the way to, to um, 40 BC. So before the time of Christ. So there's some that claim that it was, it was all finalized before the time of Christ. But then some people say, no, it wasn't finalized then. And rather, it was only finalized later on. May, maybe not until the second century AD or even later. Okay. All right. Uh, but then the earliest evidence of an existence of a Hebrew canon, the earliest evidence, okay, um, the earliest evidence comes through the Greek historian, Josephus, okay? The Greek, um, I'm sorry, the Jewish historian, did I say Greek? I'm sorry. The Jewish historian, Josephus, okay? He wrote regarding the canon and he talks about the three parts of the Hebrew canon. So we have evidence there regarding that as well, okay? All right, next we get to the formation of Palestine and the people, and the nations of ancient West Asia, okay? Palestine is that region between the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan River, okay? A small area. If you look on the map, you know, Palestine is so tiny, okay? Between the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan River. Now, this region is very strategically placed between three continents, Europe on the north, Asia on the east, and then Egypt in the south, okay? The formation of the land and the nations are quite a troubled history. A lot of problems has been there in that region. We know that. Now, but the, what is unique is that this land, Palestine, was actually as a crossroads of the known world at that time. So if someone is going from Asia to Egypt, they would have to go through Palestine. If somebody is going from Egypt to Asia or Egypt to, uh, to Europe, they would have to go through Palestine. If somebody is going from, from Europe to uh, Egypt, they would have to go through Palestine. So why is that important? It's important because it connected people from various regions and brought their religion and the culture and the commerce and the politics, all of that came through Palestine, okay? So Palestine, they saw, Palestine saw the connection of various religions, religions from Egypt, religions from uh, Assyria, Babylonian religions and uh, Mesopotamian religions. And then even from the North, they saw different religions coming together different cultures coming together, and even political trouble as well, because everybody wanted to control the small piece of land. Everybody wanted control over Palestine. Even today, we know there's a lot of fighting going on about Palestine, because everybody is very much interested in Palestine even now. Okay, The interest in Palestine is tremendous. It still continues like that. Okay, so the land had been under control of various nations, like nations like Egypt, Israel, Judah, 
Assyrians, Babylonians, Persians, Alexander the Great also ruled there, right? And his predecessors, his, uh, his generals, they also ruled there after him. And then the, there was a Hasmonean dynasty. And then finally the Romans take over, okay? And what we know as the Greco-Roman time, until the time of Jesus, the Romans were in control. So this land of Palestine was a very precious land because it was a crossroads of the known world. Okay? You had to go through there to go anywhere. But that also created a lot of problems for the people. All right. So, so the first section, the first section, the general introduction to the Hebrew Bible, that entire section is complete now. And uh, yeah, I want to one more time give you an opportunity to ask any questions because the first section is completed. And so maybe this might be a good time to just stop for a moment and uh, take any questions you may have. Anyone, please? Okay. All right. If there are no further questions, um, and if you have any doubt, if you want me to repeat something that I said or clarify something, you can ask, and I am willing to do that, okay? If you want, need any clarification, something you didn't understand, maybe some words I said you didn't understand, uh, please ask, and I can help to clarify that. Uh, you can ask it verbally, or you can leave a question in the chat box, okay? All right. Let's continue. Sir, the yes. books included in uh, Torah, Nebim, Ketubim, and all uh, uh, that will be that you will get from the notes afterwards. No. Yeah, yeah. The exact books sure. included in Torah, Nebim. Sure. Right oh yes, yes. I I don't think you will have to list all of that in the examination, but okay, yeah, okay. you will get that later on. Yeah. Okay. All right, let's go to the next section, which is the origin of the patriarchs. Okay, who are the patriarchs? Well, we know the patriarchs as Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and his descendants, Joseph. These are all considered the patriarchs of the Jewish people or the patriarchs of the Israelites, the Hebrew people. Now, the wandering Aramean. What is this wandering Aramean? Our father or my father was a wandering Aramean. And this terminology has caused concern for many centuries. People have wondered, what does this mean? Who is the Aramean? Okay, we know that Abraham came from Mesopotamia, and that is not Aram, or that is not the Aramean area. Where does this idea come from? So there's been various suggestions, but uh, the, the Bible gives us some clues and want to look at some of those clues now. See, you remember the stories of Jacob. His mother's family was referred to as Arameans. You find various references in Genesis, like Genesis 25, verse 20, Genesis 28, and many other texts also. Okay, Jacob's mother okay, and her family members are referred to as Arameans. When Jacob fled from his brother Esau, uh, Esau wanted to kill Jacob, and he ran away. Where did he go? He went to Padan Aram, okay, which was an Aramean place, which was considered Aram. This area, Padan Aram, was outside the land of Canaan. Okay? And we know that almost all of Jacob's children, I think all except one of the, uh, of the boys, were born there as well. Where were they born? In Padan Aram. So it is possible that the entire clan, the entire family, okay, and the children, they grew up and they might have understood themselves to be Arameans. So therefore, the tradition might have been passed on that they are Arameans, okay? Now, Jacob struggled with his father-in-law is just an indication of the various struggles this clan faced. Okay, it's just a kind of a small indication. 
See, they were like some semi-nomadic tribal group. Semi-nomadic means that they roamed the land for pasture lands for their animals. They had a lot of cattle and sheep and goats and all of that. And so they needed food for these animals. And so they would travel to wherever they can find enough grass. And we know that they had a lot of cattle, so they needed places where lots of grass and lots of water was available. But they faced opposition from various neighbors who saw them as a threat and saw them as outsiders. Actually, this began to happen even from the time of Abraham. Okay, we know that from that time of Abraham, there was always a struggle for land, struggle for getting enough food and, and, uh, and water for the animals. And that was always a struggle that they had. Okay, so the wandering Aramean, the struggle for survival. Why were they wandering? They were wandering because they were looking for food for their cattle. So they were semi-nomadic. In other words, they settled for some time but after a while, they moved on. They did not settle and stay very long. Okay. Now, letter B, historicity of the patriarchs. The idea, historicity of the patriarchs, is the historical value of the patriarchs. Okay. So we look at, uh, well, you know, did the, did the patriarchs really exist? Did these people really live? See, some scholars have questioned if they really were accurate people, uh, if the story is really accurate or if it was fiction. But by comparing the life, the customs, and practices of the patriarchs with those of the Canaanites of that time, we find that there are a lot of similarities. So the kind of life that Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob, the kind of life they lived, and uh, their customs and all of that, you find that it is very similar to the other people of that land of Canaan. And so that gives us a clue that, yes, this could have been an actual story, the actual life experience. And there is sufficient evidence to believe that the ancestors actually were real people. And these stories are real stories and not fiction. Now, most of the questions do come up by some scholars because of doubts they have about written material of the Old Testament. What are the kind of doubts that they have? Well, for example, uh, one of the doubts might be some people they see in Genesis chapter 1, there is a creation story. In Genesis chapter 2, there seems to be another creation story. So some people say, what is this? Two creation stories? Why is that necessary? Okay, so, so because of that, they think that, uh, oh, this is just uh, material that they collected from various places. This doesn't have to be really accurate. Okay, but if you look at the stories very carefully, you will find that Genesis chapter 1 is talking about a general creation of everything, okay? But then, if you go to Genesis chapter 2, it is more focused on the creation of Adam and Eve. It's almost like looking at it at the uh, macro level and then zooming down to a micro level or zooming out and zooming in. So Genesis chapter 1 was kind of the zooming out where you saw the big picture of everything that was created. Genesis chapter two was the more narrow one. That's one example. And then uh, I'll tell a few more, there are many. Uh, doublets and triplets is another one, doublets and triplets. You know, stories such as Abraham, uh, when he said that his wife was his sister, okay, to escape uh, being killed. Well, we see that that story was repeated by Isaac as well. So some scholars feel that this shows that these were from two different documents. This shows that these are not from the same story. 
And they also say that this shows that Isaac was really not the son of Abraham. All right, these are the uh, reasonings that they have. They feel that the doublets or triplets, meaning uh, certain stories that are double or triple uh, in various places, that causes a concern. And to them, in their understanding, they understand that this was material that was gathered from different places. Okay, well, could that be the case? What is the issue? Think about it. Is it possible that children could repeat the sin of their fathers? If Abraham did like that and he escaped with his life and he got wealth as well, is it possible that Isaac could repeat the sins of the father? Important question to ask, right? All right. Another one uh, is that texts that seem to be out of place in, or inserted into the wrong place. And uh, so sometimes you might read certain texts that doesn't seem to have a proper flow. <clears throat> and uh, some people feel that this is evidence that, uh, that this is from various documents. Okay. Could it be? Yes, maybe it could be. But I also want to ask you, we are talking about documents that were written thousands of years ago. Documents that were written maybe 1,500 or more, much longer. <clears throat> what kind of writing styles did they have? What kind of literary perspectives did they have? We cannot evaluate ancient texts with modern literary perspectives. Okay, so uh, another uh, problem that people try to point out is that the names of different places seems to use a modern name or a later name than where the story took place. For example, you remember a name of a place called Luz. Luz was a place where Jacob ran away and the sun was setting and he needed to rest. And that place, he rested it says that he had a stone for a pillow. And at the night, he had seen a vision or a dream. And in the morning when he got up, he said, oh, this is none other than the house of God. And he called the place Beth El. Beth El. Beth means house and El is the word for God. And he said, oh, this is the house of God. And so that place from then on became known as Beth El. Okay, but traditionally that place was called Luz. Okay, now even before that place was named as Bethel, you would have some places where the term Bethel is used. And so some scholars have doubts regarding that, and they would say, look, and this shows that, um, you know, if this shows to them, that means that this was written at a much later time. Okay, so these are some of the concerns that scholars have regarding the text of the Old Testament. All right. Uh, <clears throat> let me go through the next point and then we'll take a break and uh, we'll get to the number three, liberation from Egyptian slavery. So letter D, Israelites worship and relationship with God. Israelites worship and relationship with God. See, from the earliest times, the patriarch Abraham, <clears throat> or from the earliest patriarch, which was Abraham, they were presented as worshippers. They built altars at significant places of their lives, and they worshipped. Even times of celebration, problem, distress, danger, whatever it was, whatever happened in their lives, they, they saw that as a reason to worship Yahweh worship their God. Now, their worship was similar to the common worship patterns of the community where they lived. They sacrificed animals, they burned incense, they poured oil on the altar, and uh, performed other functions. So, for the patriarchs, the worship was a key to their relationship with God. The worship was central in their lives. We find that at important points in their lives, worship was primary, okay? So Israelites worship 
and their relationship with God. All the way back, it began. And then even later on, we see that worship as a primary aspect of their, uh, of their relationship of their time. It was a primary aspect. Why? Because, you see, even then, uh, even during the time uh, that they were settled in the new land, Okay, after the slavery in Egypt and God delivered them and they were settled in the new land, even at that time, they had sacrifices and worship. Okay, and they had weekly, they had the Sabbath and the Sabbath times also was a time for worship. And then they have different festivals and each of the festivals were actually times of worship and renewing their relationship with God, renewing their covenant with God. Okay. So we looked at several factors. We looked at two things. First, we began with a general introduction to the Hebrew Bible, how we talked about the nature, authority, and inspiration of the Bible. Then we talked about how the Bible was formed. Okay. And then we talked about what the word Tanakh means, Torah, Nabim, and Ketubim of the Hebrew Bible. And we also talked about various manuscripts and translations and how the Old Testament canon was formed. We talked about that. We began talking about the formation of Palestine and the people, nations of, of ancient West Asia and why Palestine was so important and so valuable. And the second part of our outline is the origin of the patriarchs, okay? The wandering Aramean. What is the idea of Aramean? Who was the Aramean? And then are the patriarchs really historical figures? Are they truly historical figures or are they just a character in a book, All right? Now, some people, if you ask them, did Abraham really exist? <clears throat> they would say, oh yes, he existed in the text, okay? These might be people that do not believe that Abraham really existed, but they would say, yes, they existed in the text, okay? Historicity. And then we talked about the life and the customs and the practices of the patriarchs. When you compare that with uh, the time of the Canaanites, they seem to match. And definitely it could have been from that time. And then finally, we talked about Israelites' worship and their relationship with God. Okay, Their relationship with, relationship with God was centered around worship. Worship was a primary aspect Worship was not a separate category. <clears throat> Many times we as Christians, we, we almost separate God from our lives. You know, worship is only when we go to church. Okay, that is our place of worship. No, 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 no. Worship, church building is not the only place of worship. Worship can be our own lives as worship. Worship can be the home. Worship can be where we go to work, where we are traveling. Worship can be anytime. There's no particular time or particular place for worship. Worship can be any time. But of course, we appreciate the gathering together of the believers, but we have something we can learn from the, uh, from the Israelites. The worship can be anywhere. All right, so these are some of the factors that I've mentioned. And I want to give you one more opportunity, um, one more opportunity to, um, to ask any doubts or questions. And then after that, we can take a break. I think Jobin, um, his um, connection had some trouble, but, uh, but I think Jobin is connecting again. Jobin, are you home now? Okay, so maybe your connection will be better this time. So we have stopped at the second point uh, or second division of our outline. And uh, now we're going to take a break for maybe about five minutes, okay? So we'll take a break for five minutes. In India, it is about 8.02. So we'll go to maybe about, um, you know, just before 8.10, we'll come back. Eight, oh, eight minutes after or something like that, okay? We'll come back and uh, we'll take a break. And if you think of any doubts or questions, you can type it into the chat box and we'll come back again, okay? Thank you. We'll see you in about five minutes. Okay, so we are back now, continuing our class on uh, understanding the Old Testament, the BCS Rampur course through Faith Theological Seminary. 
And uh, we went through two of the major aspects of this course in the syllabus. And the first one was the general introduction to the Hebrew Bible. And the second one was the origin of the patriarchs. Now <clears throat> we come to number three, liberation from Egyptian slavery. Okay, liberation from Egyptian slavery. Actually, slavery was nothing new. Slavery was quite common during that time period. All through various places, slavery was very common. When you really think about it, <clears throat> Joseph going into Egypt itself initially was also as a result of slavery. Now, of course, we know that as a result of that bad practice of slavery itself, um, their life was preserved. God used something bad. God used something very negative to preserve the life of many people. So we know that and we acknowledge that. Okay, But is slavery good? Of course not. But God used something that was not good, something that was bad, something that was part of the culture of that time, it's part of the practices of that time, he used it <clears throat> to bring about some other good things. See, the Israelites ended up in Egypt, and they were in good standing with permission from the Pharaoh to dwell in that land. But things changed quickly. Okay, Things changed quickly because a new Pharaoh had come into power. So a new, uh, uh, a new king had come into power who had no knowledge of Joseph or what Joseph had done for the nation. And nor did he know anything about the agreement with the previous king. Okay? And at that point, he began to realize and they recognized that the people grew in number and their wealth grew. And therefore, they perceived these people as a threat to their nation, as a national threat. And it was under this premise that the Israelites were taken as slaves. And they served that nation for about 400 years. Okay? The, the, we know that the Israelites, we know that the Egyptians were very cruel to the Israelites. Very cruel. And uh, they made them work and they had just enough food to survive. And so the slavery was really bad, and the oppression was horrific. Then we see God identifying with the oppressed, letter B, God identifying with the oppressed. We know, we have read in the book of Exodus, where God says, I have, I have seen the misery of the people. I have heard their cries. So God is identifying with the oppressed, people, his own people, but they were oppressed, and God is identifying with, that, with them. So God is not someone who stays away from people. God is not someone who stays apart from those who are oppressed, from those who are in problem or struggling. God is someone who comes close to those who are struggling. But look at throughout the entire Bible, we see that as a clear theme, not only in the Old Testament and even in the New Testament as well. We see God moving closer toward those who are oppressed, those who are bound, those who are sick, those who are poor, those who are troubled. God seems to have a special place in the heart for such people. Then we see the role of women for the liberation of the Hebrews. Well, actually, several women are involved here. Okay. Now, the Pharaoh's daughter uh, is an important figure as well because she is the one that takes she is the one that takes Moses and raises him like her own son. And then, of course, the other two women involved here will be Moses' sister and Moses' mother. And then there's another woman. There are there are a few other women that are significant. These were the midwives who refused to kill the, uh, the male 
children that were born to the Israelites. Okay, they refused to kill them, although the ruling was given by the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, that whenever a male child was born, whenever a boy was born, that that boy should be killed. But the, these women, they refused to do that. The Bible says because they feared God, they would not do it. Okay, so thus we see the life of Moses coming up. What about his life? Well, he had a life that he grew up in the um, he grew up in the palace, but his life was actually kind of a, a two pronged life. That means he grew up in the palace, but also his mother had direct influence on his life as well. Okay, so he may have learned Hebrew from his mother, and he actually, although he grew up officially as the daughter of Pharaoh's, as the son of Pharaoh's daughter, still he had the connection with the Hebrews because his mother was the one who actually raised him from a very young age. And then we see the calling of Moses, okay? The calling of Moses comes after he had to run away because we see how Moses had killed an Egyptian and buried him in the sand. And so we saw, we see the life of the situation with Moses changing. Because even when Moses went out there among the people, specifically what was going on was he was actually saying that, you know, I wanted to experience what my people are experiencing. I want to see what my people are experiencing. And thus he went out there among the people. See, this is what's going on. So Moses literally understood himself as a part of the Hebrews. He knew that this was a, his life. This was his background. He knew that. So he went out to the people to connect with them, to see what they're experiencing. And he was actually troubled by that. And that's why he ended up killing that Egyptian who was abusing one of the, uh, one of the Jewish people, one of the Hebrews. And so he had to run away. And we know that he ran away and went to a place called Midian. Okay. And, uh, and the calling of Moses was very unique. He, began, he saw a, a bush that was burning. There was fire there, but it wasn't burning up. And so he realized this is something very unusual and unique. He has seen fires in the desert, in the wilderness, there are fires, it's common. But whenever there's a fire like that, it's a dry place, what happens? That bush would burn up quickly and then all you have is ashes left. But this one, this fire continued and this bush was not being burned up. So he said, this is something very unusual. So he walked up there. And as soon as he walks up, he hears a voice saying that he is not to come any closer and that he should take off his sandals because he was on holy ground. He was, because God was there. Okay, so the calling of Moses was quite unique. Although he objected to the calling, God had a specific plan. God had a specific plan to bring him up as a leader. God knew that he wanted to use him to do something very unique. See, what happened is Moses' life was specifically designed by God. Moses' life was specifically designed by God so that Moses would be brought up in the palace with special education, special training, and all of that. Because who else would lead a group of people like this out? Think about this. Do you think one of the other slaves could have done it? Well, maybe he could, but it's less likely. Okay, Because they would not have the knowledge or the understanding or leadership capability to do that. You see, the, the pharaohs or the kings of that time, what they would do is they have many children, and their children would be taught well and trained in military, in leadership, in all these areas they're trained and developed, and their children will be the ones 
who would be governors, who would be overseeing different regions throughout their nation. That's how they did it, okay? Um, so Moses already had all the training for leadership and for knowledge. He was trained. So Moses, we see, became a good leader for the people. But God had to do some things in him, and God had to bring him to a point where he did not rely on his abilities, but that he relied on God. Okay, so from the beginning, we see that God brings Moses to the place where he needed God. He could not do anything without God. First of all, he has a problem with his speaking, and that was also a point where he needed God's help. And then also he came to, he was brought to the point where Pharaoh would not let the people go. And so God did numerous miraculous signs. Why did he do that? Well, obviously he did it so that Pharaoh can understand that God is powerful and the people of Egypt can understand God is powerful, but also he wanted to bring Moses to a point of frustration. He wanted to bring Moses to a point where there was nothing more that he could do. Only a miracle of God would make it work. See? So although he had the training, he had the education, he had the leadership ability, he had all of that. Still, God wanted to bring him to the point where he would rely completely on God. Okay? The next item is the Exodus theology. The Exodus theology. In other words, it's the whole theology of liberation. The law the covenant, and the presence of Yahweh. These are various aspects of the Exodus. First of all, we begin with liberation. Okay, These are the things that we learn from the book of Exodus. Liberation. What is this liberation? Liberation is the fact that God always wants to bring liberation, bring release and freedom to those who are bound, freedom to the captives, freedom to those who are poor, freedom to those who are oppressed. That's why even today, the modern day, the church needs to focus on people like that rather than spending all of our time and effort on energy on people that are well off, people that can have lots of money or lots of power, instead of that being our focus. Now, we don't reject those people, but instead of that being our focus, we need to have the kind of focus that God has and be a liberative force in our community, okay? Those who are sick, those who are oppressed, those who are troubled, those who are demon-possessed, those who are, uh, are in bondage in numerous ways, we need to extend our hand to bring release to them. So we see a theology of liberation in the book of Exodus. We also see the law being given in Exodus. The law was actually the stipulation that connected God and his people. God told the Israelites that I will be your God and you will be my people. And the law was to be the stipulations that would be the binding force connecting them. Okay? And this was important. And we see the law being given. We see the Ten, Ten Commandments being given. All of these things are important factors of the relationship of the people with their God. See, the law was the basis for the covenant. Okay, The law was the basis for the covenant with God. And that covenant with God, God said, see, I will make that covenant, and that covenant will be the solidifying force, the strong force that would keep them related and connected, and that would keep both of them, meaning God and his people, dependent. They would keep both God and his people connected in that sense. So God says, look, I will be bound to you. I will do all I can to bring you release, <clears throat> to guide you and to keep you, and to provide for you, and to take care of you. 
You in return, you need to obey my laws. And then the presence of Yahweh is a vital aspect in the theology of Exodus. <clears throat> we see that as the people were traveling through the wilderness, we see that God was there in the midst of them. God was there in the midst of them in a pillar of cloud and a fire. Okay, there was a cloud and a fire. <clears throat> God was there in the midst of them. Even there, during the times like the Mount Sinai, when God was giving the law, we see God coming down and there's thunder, lightning, and all of these things. Why? Because God wanted to show the people that he is there. Okay, so these are different aspects of the theology of Exodus, that God's presence was there. First of all, liberation. <clears throat> it's really a book of liberation, that the law was given and the covenant was given, which are both connected. And then finally, the presence of Yahweh. This is the Exodus theology or the theology of the book of Exodus. Then we go for uh, go to the next major section, number four, occupation and settlement in Palestine. <clears throat> All right. Now, there are different models of the settlement. In other words, we have in the Bible what is called the conquest model. That's what the Bible gives us, right? The Bible, the story in the Bible specifically says that God did a miracle for them that Joshua and the rest of the Israelites went in and fought these people and they took over the land. Okay, it was uh, like a military force going in and taking over the land. But the Bible is very clear that these people were not military ready, they were not war ready, they were not warriors. But the Bible is clear that God was working on their behalf. Now, there are several other models. In other words, some people do not believe <clears throat> that such a conquest was possible. They say that, see, all a group of slaves, these are descendants of slaves. What do they know about warfare? How is it possible they could just walk into um, a foreign nation and just attack and take over the entire land? They say it's just not possible. Okay, So they came up with different they came up with different models or different ideas that they think might have been other possibilities. One of those is called peaceful infiltration. In other words, they did not go in like it says in the book of Exodus, but rather what they did was, or as it says in the book of um, uh, Joshua, going in and fighting and no, they said, no, it's not possible. Instead, it was a peaceful infiltration that they just simply went into the land uh, and uh, settled in various places, small, small tribal groups. Each of the 12 tribes, you know, they were all different tribal groups that had gone in and peacefully infiltrated land, that, that place. And then there's another model of a peasant revolt. Peasant revolt is the fact, the idea that these people had gone in, the different tribes of Israel, the tribes of of, uh, of Israel had gone in and they dwelt among the Canaanite people. And then there is the idea that the Canaanites, peasants that were there, they wanted to fight against their overlords. They wanted to fight against the Canaanite kings. And so the Israelites joined, the tribes of Israel joined in that revolt and fought with them and took over. Okay, all of these different models, these are just a couple of the models that are mentioned here, and many others, but these two models I will mention here. Okay, these models have come up because many people cannot believe that it is possible for a group of former slaves or descendants of slaves to just go in and just, you know, fight war and have warfare with people that are already settled there and to take over. It's not possible. Okay, and so these different models have been suggested by different scholars, peaceful infiltration and peasant revolt. And then, of course, the biblical model is the conquest. Okay, that is shown in the book of Joshua. All right, what about the conquest? Well, God specifically told them that they are not able, they're too weak. God said, I will fight for you. 
we know that God said, I will fight for you. I will be the one who will fight your battles. And so God was the one who fought for them and brought a victory for them. Okay. Structure of tribal society in Israel. Structure of tribal society in Israel. I don't want to go through all of these because there's so much, but uh, and there's not enough time for that. It's already 8.30. Okay. So what we find is that we have the 12 tribes of Israel living together. And each of the tribes had within their tribe, there were clans and families. And the tribes connected with each other. Okay, and the tribal groups all kind of had a federation and they connected with each other. Now, the political and religious life during the period of the judges. Now, the period of the judges is very unique because when you read the book of Judges, you begin to wonder what kind of life did they live? What kind of people were these? What is happening here? Okay, it's unbelievable. Well, what was happening is this. You see, these people, they came out of Egypt and they were slaves for 400 years. And also <clears throat> um, 40 years in the desert and all the people that came out of Egypt had died except the young ones. And then what you have is a descendant of these people. So they're coming into a new land they don't know how to live in a settled land, in their own land. They don't know. And they're learning how to connect with each other, learning how to communicate with each other, learning how to relate, live in relationship with each other and relationship with God. This was a time of the judges, a time of so much turmoil. Their religion, their faith was always up and down. They worshiped Yahweh, but then they began worshiping other gods as well. It was a time of turmoil and confusion during the time of the judges. Now, during the judges, you have what is called the office or the role of a judge. In the Hebrew, the word is shofe. Okay, It was a judge. Now, when we think of the word judge, we think of in the modern sense of um, you know, uh, a court. But for the Israelites, it wasn't like that. It was rather a, simply a leader. The judges of that time were leaders. Now, how were the judges um, assigned? Was there an election? Obviously not. The judges actually were people who rose up in power because God had an impact on their lives. God, during the times of distress, whenever the Israelites went away from God, and they began worshiping other idols and worshiping other gods, okay? God sent the neighboring nations to attack them, to punish them. At that time, although God sent these people to punish them, at the same time, God provided a way of release. Look at that. This is God's mercy, okay? He wants to correct them. He wants to discipline them. But along with the correction and the discipline, he brings release for them. He brings deliverance for them as well. Okay, So we see how the judges became a point of balance for them. They were actually the rulers of that land during that time. The judges were. Okay. Then we go. So uh, then we go to the tribal organization. We talked about that already. How the tribes work together, something like a federation. Okay, connected together uh, in various ways, kind of like a federation. All right. Then we'll go to the monarchy and the period of the monarchy and of the united monarchy. Before I go there, let me give you one more chance to ask any questions that you may have, and uh, we will go on further from there. <clears throat> so we talked about liberation from Egypt and slavery and occupation and settlement in Palestine. Questions, doubts, or anything that you need clarification, or you want me to repeat something? Uh, I had a quick question. Yes, uh, am I audible? Yes. 
so it's not it's not um you know the in the syllabus which we got uh, the different canonizations and the different texts which we have is is this all what we need to study or is there any part of the course where we are going to study these in a bit more depth um, for the text that or the examination yeah as in as in the sense of learning in the course um, learning for the exam, you mean? Are you speaking specifically for the exam? Yeah. Okay. Oh, do you know when is the exam coming up? What is the date of the exam? Somewhere in November. In November. Okay. So there's a little bit of time left. And um, uh, so I, as I mentioned to you, that uh, the material that we have right now, uh, although it is good material that we have now a new syllabus. And um, so uh, the, the material is being rewritten. Okay, the rewriting is going on. And, um, uh, and hopefully we can get that to you without too much delay. Okay, now you already have the material that was given to you, uh, which would look something like this. Okay, and so, uh, and, and you have, you know, the understanding of the Old Testament. So that is something that you have, and it is good. And please make sure to read that and go through that. But then uh, we have an updated syllabus. And so this updated syllabus has more than that. So I'm in the process of adding more. And that adding, uh, that, excuse me, that uh, that adding is being done. And, uh, and then some editorial work is there. And as soon as we can, we'll get it to you. Okay. All right. Anyone else? And I think you will also have, um, maybe IPSAR has given you some previous question papers as well. Um, if he hasn't given it to you, it, you, should all, you should be getting it. And uh, when you get that, make sure to pay more attention to the recent question papers, like from 2021, okay? Pay, pay more attention to those, give more value to those than the earlier ones, because those are the ones that are with the new syllabus. Okay, so now, now let's talk, talk about the emergence of the monarchy and the period of united monarchy, okay? All right, how did this monarchy emerge? Where did this come from? What happened? Well, we know that during the time of the judges, there were kings that, there were judges that rose up in leadership, but there was no permanence there. Okay, there was no permanence there. And then of course, uh, Samuel was probably the last judge, but then we find that Samuel's sons could not take leadership either. So that became a difficulty. So the people were in such difficult situation where the neighboring nations were constantly attacking them. They were constantly troubled by various nations, overtaking them and destroying their crops, all kinds of problems they were, they were facing from neighboring nations. And they had no organized, army that was ready to protect the nation. And so the people realized that, you know, we need something like that. And so that's when they went to, um, they went to Samuel and said, look, we, we, need, we need a king. Okay, we need a king so that he can bring an army together and we'll have protection. Okay, so that was the beginning of the emergence of monarchy. The people saw that as a need of military control and protection. Now, what is the problem with that, biblically? Well, God wanted to be their king. God said, I am your king. But then what was happening? The people are saying, but, but, but we are being attacked. We have all these problems. And God is not doing anything about it. Do we have an answer for that? Well, the answer is, why were they being attacked? Why were they facing these problems from foreign nations? 
the Bible is very clear that God wanted them to worship Yahweh alone. But rather, the people began worshiping other nations, other gods, or the gods of other nations. And so that is the time when God began sending other countries, other nations to come and attack them and to punish them. But then the people were not thinking about that. They're thinking about simply protection. And so the monarchy uh, came into power during that time. God provided a way for that. And they said, okay, you want a king? You're given a king. And then you have a time period where there was a united monarchy. Okay, we know that Saul became the first king, but then he did not obey God. And then God replaced him and brought David. And it took some time for David to come into power and to unite all of Israel. That was quite an important task because Israel was all kind of spread out because they were all different tribal groups. Okay, then they were finally brought together at the time of David. That was called the United Monarchy. And then the United Monarchy continued through his son Solomon. And then we see internal and external factors for the emergence of the monarchy. What is that? Okay. What was the internal and external factors? Well, the internal factors was the fact that the, the people were unhappy <clears throat> about their situation. They were completely uh, scattered throughout the land. The various tribal groups were loosely connected, not properly connected. So they wanted something where they could bring more connection. And the external factors, of course, is the threat from the neighboring nations. All of these things created, brought them to a place where they said, you know, we've got to have a king. We need protection from our enemies. Okay. All right. <clears throat> So what was the condition of the people of Israel under the United Monarchy? Actually, under the United Monarchy with David and with Solomon, the condition of the people was very good. Okay, how so? Well, because they were able to get the people focused on to God and worship, and worship became a central aspect. David wanted to build a temple for God, but God said no. I will have your son build. And so Solomon builds the temple. Okay. But uh, once the temple was built, what happened is that all the tribes were required to bring their sacrifices to Jerusalem and, uh, and to offer the sacrifices there. And so that was a, a, a joining factor, a connecting factor for all of the people. Now, what about the role of Saul, David, and Solomon? And I already mentioned about that, okay? Saul was the first one to gather somewhat of a military together. They did never had a military, okay? They never had a military, but Saul made his first attempt of putting together a military. And then David, his primary role for David was the unification of the entire land, of all the people, unified them together together as a nation. And then Solomon's unique contribution <clears throat> was a contribution of wisdom and organization and expansion. He was a man of wisdom, okay? And, but he also knew how to organize the, the country and bring everything together and make it very strong. And also, he also expanded and took over other areas that were earlier uh, not in their power, okay? So there was a lot of expansion. So the time of Solomon, the time of Solomon often is referred to as the golden era of the Israelites. It's often referred to as the golden era of the Israelites, okay? Because of the amazing things he had done and wealth, all of that began to grow in Israel during the time of Solomon, okay? Then the role of priests, and prophets. What about the role of priests and prophets? The role of priests, specifically during the time of the United Monarchy, was that they were the constant connectors for God. The priests, they taught the people and they were focused on connecting them with God. The prophets 
role, obviously, was to hear from God. Of course, the prophets, they came at a later time, okay? Their role was much later, but we see the prophets spoke for God. Then we go to the divided monarchy, number six. What caused the division? Well, there were numerous causes, and the Bible specifically mentions um, Saul's son, Rehoboam. Rehoboam was approached by the people once he became king, approached by the people, and said, look, you're a young man, but your father was very strong and very, very uh, cruel in many ways. They said uh, he was a hard taskmaster, and uh, we want to know what you will do. And you know the story and how he rejected the advice of the seniors and went after the advice of people his own age, his younger friends. And they said, no, 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 don't give a favorable answer. You know, be tough like your father. And, uh, but then, you know, the thing is that um, uh, Rehoboam did not have the, uh, have the, what do you call it? Uh, the, the, the connection with the people his power was not established to be able to do that type of a ruling. So because of a lack of wisdom, okay, and you would think that Solomon's son should be wise, but somehow he did not act wisely. Instead, you know, he acted foolishly and uh, Israel became divided. From there on, we see the divided monarchy, okay? And what about what are the consequences of the divided monarchy? Well, they became weaker. They became weaker. Uh, together, they were very strong. And then all of a sudden, you ended up with two different kingdoms, Israel and Judah. Okay. And then one of the major causes is the factor of the northern kingdom being a totally separate country. Ten tribes are there. And finally, they ended up building their own temple. Now, why did now, Jeroboam was the leader of the north. Why did Jeroboam build a temple there? Well, he built the temple there because if all the people from there came to Jerusalem to offer sacrifices, <clears throat> gradually the hearts of the people would be drawn toward Judah, the southern kingdom. And so he may lose his power. So he said, okay, I will build a temple there. And so he built a temple and he began to assign priests there in the new kingdom, okay? And so what happened there in the new kingdom? Well, the problem there was the fact that uh, the, new, the new priests that were assigned were not really, they were not really the priests that were descendants of Aaron. Priests were all supposed to be the descendants of Aaron, and they were supposed to be the of the Levitical tribe, but they didn't do that. Instead, they just began assigning anyone to be priests, and they began to fall away from Yahweh. Now, Judah also did, but it seems that Israel, the northern tribe, did that even more. Okay, and so it was, uh, it was, a, it was a, it, in in many ways. The people went away from God even more. The connection was lost. And finally, we see both kingdoms, Judah and Israel, completely turning away from God. And the kings and those people that are in power, they began to usurp their authority and they began to live in a way that they pleased themselves. And they began to... Uh, they began to exploit the people for power, for money, for wealth, and they began building their own wealth, and the people were exploited. The poor were exploited. The poor and the oppressed were even oppressed further. And so God sent the prophets, numerous prophets, to speak to them, and they put many of the prophets to death. Many of the prophets were rejected, and they did not listen to the voice of God speaking to them. They didn't want to hear it. They were more interested in themselves. So what happened? You had the fall of the two kingdoms. The northern kingdom first fell. 
And who took that? The Assyrians took the people, the 10 tribes of the Northern Kingdom, the Assyrians took them. And the Assyrians, what they did was they had the particular way of taking all these people and scattering them in all the different lands. So that the, that's why you hear the term of the lost 10 tribes, right? The lost tribes of Israel, the 10 lost tribes of Israel, because the Assyrians took these 10 tribes and scattered them all over the land. And so they lived in different places and they just meshed and blended with the local communities and they did not keep their own identity. Nobody knows who those people are, where they are. They're all lost, kind of blended with other nations. Okay, but then the southern kingdom, Judah, they were taken away by the Babylonians. Now, what was unique about the Babylonians or different about the Babylonians was that they didn't scatter their captives. They kept them together in one place. So all the people from Judah that were taken to Babylonia, they were all held together in one place. So they were able to keep their identity they kept their worship, their religion, their faith, their teachings. Their, they, they tried to keep the language together, their culture together. All of that, they made an attempt to keep that together because the people were together. Then we look at the social religious situation of the exiles, the Israelites in exile. Let's talk about that. Just give me just a minute. See, in exile, they had a big struggle because you had both the people trying to keep their Jewish, their Israelite heritage. At the same time, the following, the new generations born in exile, remember that was 70 years. The new generation born in exile, they were more connected with the Babylonians. Okay, they were more connected with the language of the Babylonians, the culture of the Babylonians, and less connected with the Hebrew culture, faith, religion, and all of that. So because of that, the situation was kind of twofold. You had the older generations that really wanted to stay connected with Yahweh. The, you had the younger, younger generation that were not so much interested. Okay, now there were some prophets that were together with them in exile. They continue to prophesy. They continue to speak. They continue to say that, look, this is something that God is doing. God is going to take you back. Some people believed it and others were doubtful. Okay. So they began to, so, and then you have in your notes there, theological response. See, what happened is it's well possible that during that time, whatever there are two different views regarding that. Some people feel that during the time of the exile, that was the time when all of the Bible was written or all of the uh, Old Testament, um, all of the Torah, okay, was written. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, all of those things were written during that time. But then, as I said earlier, it's well possible that, it is possible that, during the time of the wilderness period, it is possible that Moses could have done some writing. Now, how much he wrote, we don't know, but he definitely could have done some writing. And then during the time of the monarchy, it's possible that that writing could have been taken and revised and edited and updated. And then when they're in exile, it's possible that, that those documents are available to them to further review and further develop it and to further edit them to bring it to the form that we have right now. So that is the theological response in the sense that they began to think about what was going on. Why did this happen to us? Why did this happen to us? What is the reason why Yahweh, our God, forgot us? Aren't we his people? And then very specifically, the prophets began to tell them and to teach them that, look, yes, you are God's people, but then you walked away from God. You are God's people, and he loves you. But because you began to follow other gods, and because you began to, uh, you began to take advantage of your 
the poor among you, the people that were in your nation that you should have shown mercy to them. Instead, you were cruel to them. You took advantage of them and you put them down. And God said, I will have no more of this. And he sent you away. That is the theological response. The people began to think and understand that no, it is not by chance that we were taken into exile, that God himself allowed this to happen. Okay, then we come to the uh, last section, the return and restoration. Okay, so let me give you another opportunity. Anyone would like to ask any questions or comments? <clears throat> So the recording is continuing and um, I hope I can get it uploaded hopefully tonight and uh, I should be able to send the link to you by morning. I'll put the link in the group after I upload it. Yeah. Okay, if no further questions, let me go ahead and continue. <clears throat> if there are questions, feel, feel free to ask. I will do the best I can to give clarifications. So the last section is the return and restoration, the return back to their homeland and the restoration. Under the Persian Empire, Cyrus, the Messiah of God. Okay. Actually, it was uh, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon that took them away. And we know that the Babylonians were taken over by the Persians. And so you have the Medes and the Persians that came, that came into power. And Cyrus was the ruler. Cyrus was the king. Okay, And it was Cyrus who released the people to go and rebuild their nation. Now, let me ask you, have you ever wondered why Cyrus would do such a thing? Well, of course, we know that God instructed him. God was the one who put that thought into his mind. But why would he do it? Why do those people do it? And they funded that. They paid the money for, the, for them to return and to rebuild the wall and to build the temple. They paid the money. Why? What is the motivation for that? <clears throat> well, we know that when this, when the Israelites went back and lived there, the Persians could tax them. This becomes like a uh, it, the, the Israelites continue to be attached to the Persian Empire. Okay, They were not free. They did not rule on their own, but rather they were continued to be attached there and they had to continue paying taxes. Okay, It was an ancient form of colonization. They had to continue paying taxes there. It was not truly, that they were not truly independent. And so when they returned, they began to rebuild the wall, and then they rebuilt the temple. And so a complete reorganization was taking place. Okay, why? Well, you have to understand, not only the wall was broken down, and the temple was gone, and they rebuilt that, but the entire nation had to be rebuilt. Because, you see... <clears throat> After the 70 years, the land being left bare, you have to imagine that the place would have been a mess. You know that uh, if, you, if you don't cut your grass, if you don't take care of your yard or whatever, for one week or two weeks, that's it. You, you, know, you get all these shrubs and everything growing there if you don't take care of it. Imagine 70 years. The place would have turned into like a forest by that time, literally like a forest. And so they would have to go in there and rebuild their towns and villages and cities. Everything would have to be rebuilt. Very difficult thing. They had to do it. And so the reformers, Ezra and Nehemiah, they were the ones who encouraged the people. They were the ones. And there were others also that came up. They encouraged the people and they taught the people. And there were priests and others who taught the people and encouraged them and said, look, we can do this. Rebuilding can be done. With the help of God, we can do this. Now, there was opposition. 
there were problems there, but then they went through all of that. They continued to build. People like Ezra and Nehemiah were the ones who continued to encourage the people to go ahead and build. And remember, the building was not just the building of the wall and the temple. Those are two significant factors. But not only that, along with that, they had to build their entire nation, their homes and villages and cities. Everything had to be rebuilt because the place most probably had turned into like a, like a forest. And so then what happened? A new religious structure emerged. Okay, what is the new religious structure? Well, they had the old religious structure, but along with that, what happened is uh, they were used to, they, they, they had different uh, places of worship in all the different places. Although they had the temple there, they still had synagogues in various places. Okay, they still had synagogues. And then, of course, the sacrifices never did not continue after that. Okay. And, uh, and so a new structure began to emerge. Then what happened is, see, then by the time of um, Alexander the Great, okay, by the time of Alexander the Great, the Greek culture was forced on the people, okay? The Greek culture was forced on the people. And then, some of the leaders, they began to adopt the Greek culture and the lifestyle of the Greeks. And this was completely against what God wanted them because they themselves had their own culture. They had their own religion. They had their own faith. They had their own way of life. But the Greeks, their way of life was not only that it was different, but it was also much of it was against the word of God, against the scriptures. And they could not stand with that. Then there was a revolt called the Maccabean Revolt. There's a group of people that banded together and fought against the Romans. But of course, we know that that also did not last. The Romans were too powerful. Okay, the Romans were too powerful. And there's a lot of history between the two Testaments, the Old Testament and the New Testament, about 400 years, a lot of history. And that history was a history of trying to gain power where now other nations have power. See, when, when you go back to the time before the exile in the divided monarchy, what you find is the people, because they did not follow after God, God said, look, I will throw you out of the land. And he did that. But even after they came back, they were never able to live as their own people. They lived in their own land, but they were never able to rule themselves. They were always ruled by others. The Maccabean revolt was one of those, the expressions of the people saying that we will do everything that we can to regain power over our own land. But that was also crushed by the Romans. They would not put up with it. They continued to hold power all the way through to the time of the New Testament, the time of Jesus, where Roman presence was very strong. Okay, so that brings us to the end. And uh, let me just review the main topics. <clears throat> General introduction was the first one in our outline to the Hebrew Bible itself. It's a general introduction to the Old Testament. And then number two, origin of the patriarchs. Okay, what was it? What kind of lifestyle did they have? And uh, what was their origin? Number three, liberation from Egyptian slavery. Remember, the liberation from slavery was not just an event, but that was a solidifying factor. And much of that theology was also developed through that. All right. And then number four, occupation and settlement in Palestine. Remember, there are different models of the settlement. There are different models of the settlement. It's a conquest model. There's a peaceful infiltration model. There's a peasant revolt model. Okay? Remember that and learn about what that is. Conquest model is the model that the Bible shows. The uh, Joshua and the people going in and taking over. The peaceful infiltration model is a model where the people simply 
just infiltrated the land, went, the different tribal groups went and lived among the people and slowly rose to power. The peasant revolt is where they also had already been living in that land or they moved into the land, but then the Canaanite peasants were unhappy with the Canaanite kings or the leaders that were there and the peasants were ready to revolt and the Israelites joined with the peasants and fought against them, okay? These are two different models that scholars have come up with to try to explain what seems to be an impossibility, which is the conquest model. Okay, how is it possible that a group of slaves would come in and do all of this? Then we come into the emergence of the monarchy and the period of united monarchy. Okay, and the internal and external factors for why the monarchy came into place. Well, we said that internally there was a lot of factions, internally there was a lot of strife, and they could not all stay together properly. They were all disconnected, different tribal groups. It was like a loosely connected tribal federation. As a result of that, they could not get a good, strong military together, okay? And so there was a threat from outside of other nations attacking them. And they tried, but they, the military was just not possible. And so they realized that they need a king to bring the nation together and to have a strong military. That's how this came about. And then the role of Saul, David and Solomon. Saul was the first one to begin building a military. David was the one who brought all of the tribes together as one nation. And then Solomon was the one who made the, the, the nation strong and he began to expand the nation and bring wealth and wisdom into the nation. And then we have the divided monarchy. Why? What was the causes of division? Well, you know, the idolatry among the Israelites, the Israelites worshipping other, other gods, the gods of other nations, and also the oppression that was taking place in Israel. The leaders, the people in power, they took advantage of the poor. They took advantage of the common people. Instead of upholding the poor and upholding those who were struggling, Instead, they took advantage of them. These were some of the causes that um, uh, of, um, of the division. Okay, I'm sorry. These are actually the cause. Those are the causes of the exile. The causes of the division, okay, the causes of the division was some of the infighting within the nation. And specifically, there was a lot of, there was a lot of distrust with the Davidic monarchy. There were some people that looked at David's monarchy from a different perspective. Remember, they were always, the northern tribes were separate, and Judah was separate, even from before. David was the one who brought them together, but still, the northern tribes, they still had a different perspective, as if David was somebody from the Judah. And so they saw Judah in a different way. They did not see them themselves as together. So that, that faction was still within the nation. Okay, And then, of course, you have the obvious thing where Solomon, some Rehoboam, acted without wisdom. And that was the one that finally clinched that. And then finally, the exile. And I had mixed it up and... Um, <clears throat> And the, the causes, the reason for the exile is what I said, the people oppressing the poor, the people beginning to worship other gods and other nations were having more influence on them. And they were influenced by other nations, okay? So you have the socio-religious situations of the exile that literally kind of, uh, you know, caused them to be taken into exile. God already told them that I will take you out from your land if you do such and such. Now, in exile, they struggled a lot because socially, they were completely mixed up and confused. They had uh, the older generation trying to hold on to the Hebrew culture and the language and the faith, but then the younger generation connecting more with the Babylonians. There were prophets during the exile 
that tried to encourage the people, but that was very difficult. And then uh, the exi- during the exile, what is the theological response? The theolo- theological response is this, that God hasn't just forgotten us, but that God is punishing us. He wants us to be lining up with what his desire for us is. And then finally, we have the return and restoration. Okay, It was under the Persian Empire. Remember, the Babylonians took the, 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 the people away, but then the Persians took over the Babylonians. And Cyrus was called the Messiah of God. In other words, God assigned Cyrus to be able to allow the people to return back to their land. But then remember, they reorganized, they rebuilt the wall, they rebuilt the temple, and got things together, but they never were able to rule themselves, okay? They never were able to rule themselves. Constantly, they were ruled by all the nations, and then finally you have the Romans coming in and taking over the land. And then we finally end our lesson with the Maccabean revolt, where the people could not, the <clears throat> the people could not accept the Roman lifestyle or the Greek lifestyle that was being implemented in the land. They couldn't accept it, so there was so much resistance, and that the Maccabean revolt was their attempt to regain power over their land. But then we know that the Romans completely squashed that and it was they were not able to do it, okay? And then we see the New Testament, Jesus comes on the scene and still the Roman government was in power during that time. Okay, so that brings us to the end of our syllabus. Any, any comments, any questions before we close? Okay, if there's uh, no questions and comments, um, shall we close? And, um, and then we can communicate in that group. I will put the link, hopefully tomorrow morning, it should be ready. Okay, thank you, uh, Jobin. And um, uh, Cherian is also there, Jensen and Robbins. Thank you so much for joining us. I think there was one more person, but uh, that person will also get the link to the, this video. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. God Thank bless you. Sir. Have a good night. Yeah. If you have further questions, um, you can um, contact me on WhatsApp. Um, you can find my number on WhatsApp and you can, in the group, find my number and send it to me directly, please, because I may not pay attention to the, uh, the group messages. All right, uh, there's too many groups. <laughs> so find my number. If you have specific questions, find my number uh, in that group, and then you can just uh, message me and, uh, and it will be there. Okay. Thank you. God bless you. Let me just pray for you. I'm going to pray. Father, thank you for each of these who have taken a step to learn your word. I pray that your spirit would enlighten their minds and inspire their hearts and strengthen them to do the work of your kingdom, Lord. Give them wisdom, give them understanding. Help them, O Lord, as they prepare for their exams, to read, to study, and to to be able to respond to the questions. But most of all, I pray that you would use them miraculously for your kingdom to do the works of the kingdom. Help us, O Lord, that we may live and do the works that Jesus did while he was on this earth. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day or evening. Thank you, sir. Praise the Lord. Bye.